here at TPI. Bob, as many of you know, was the uh, co-founder and executive director of the AEI Brookings Joint Center for Regulatory Policy. Um, and so to the extent that government agencies do cost-benefit analysis today, um, he takes much of the credit or blame, um, depending on which side you're, you're on. Um, and he's back from teaching and researching at Oxford University for several years. Uh, and well on his way to building what we um, internally, I guess, call the Joint Center 2.0 here, but will be much uh, even bigger and better. Uh, and with Bob helping to take the next step in making evidence-based policy a reality. And with that, I'll just hand it over to Bob. And we'll get so Scott nominally used to work for me at the, or with me at the Joint Center. And I, he said, well, what should I say in my opening remarks? And I, and I said to him, just give a little blurb about TPI, but don't say very much about me, so we can see how well the, the president of TPI follows my suggestions. Um, seriously, I, I want to thank Scott for his intellectual leadership uh, at TPI, and I'm very hopeful that we can make a modest contribution uh, with some of my partners in crime to the debate uh, over evidence-based policy and how we might move it forward in Washington. Um, I should say at the start that this conference was very much uh, a joint effort. And um, one of the protagonists, Andy Feldman, unfortunately can't join us here today because he's ill. Um, my colleague, Robert Shea, I'll have a few nasty things to say about before I exit the, uh, the platform here. So, um, I'm about to have the mic. So. <laughs> um, so, so let me say one or two words about the conference. Um, even though we're not sort of in a big round table, what I'm very hopeful that we can do today is to maximize interaction. So we very much want this to be a discussion uh, with you, the audience, and with the panelists, as opposed to what professors or former professors at Oxford do, which is to lecture. Um, there was a movie that at least a few of you probably saw on the first run many, many years ago starring Dustin Hoffman and Anne Bancroft and a couple other people called The Graduate. And in The Graduate, uh, there's a scene in the beginning of the movie uh, where Dustin Hoffman is this recently recent graduate from Berkeley. He returns to his uh, rather affluent environment somewhere around Beverly Hills. And he's aimlessly walking around the swimming pool behind his house, where his parents are holding a party for him, and he, he feels completely lost. And this gentleman, who probably was 10 years my junior, uh, but nonetheless fairly senior, walks over to him, and he whispers the immortal words, Plastics. Thank you. Audience participation. Plastics. So, so if I had to leave you with one word today, or hopefully one word that would uh, emanate from uh, uh, our distinguished legislators and policymakers in Washington, D.C., it would be evidence. And I would like them to be asking the question now, and at least a decade from now, uh, sort of patterning after Walter Mondale, if you remember Vice President Mondale, where's the evidence? He said, where's the beef? I said, where's the evidence? Um, so. There's only one problem uh, in getting from here to there. Um, and that's, as many of you know, uh, the fact that there's no natural constituency for evidence. So what are we going to do about that? The solution is we're going to create one. We're going to become a movement. This is, in the broadest sense, uh, the purpose of today's conference. Obviously, we're not going to do it in one conference in Washington, D.C., but we want to begin building a constituency that promotes evidence-based policy. And we can do that in a few ways. First, by learning from professionals in government, such as our distinguished speaker, Shelley Martinez, uh, who also played a pivotal role in the Evidence-Based Policy Commission and the report, which I'm thor sure you've thoroughly read, and uh, which will be on the test uh, just after I finish my remarks. Um, secondly, we can build on the insights of people who care deeply about that process, such as you, the audience, and our distinguished presenters. And third, we can borrow from the great work of pra practitioners like Robert Shea, Andy Feldman, and others 
Um, and I think doing that, we can build the basis for promoting this issue politically and promoting it substantively. This brings me to today's conference. So what's it about? So several of you has, have said to me, whispered to me in conversations when we had the light breakfast, that you're interested in behavioral economics. And we are going to talk about how behavioral economics contributes to evidence. We have a distinguished professor who shall remain nameless temporarily um, from Johns Hopkins, who's done some seminal work in this area. Paul Ferraro will be joining us and talking about that a little bit. Um, but so we're going to examine how behavioral insights and the field of experimentation can help build a better framework for evidence-based policy. So this leads me quite naturally to our first uh, session, and I've asked Robert to introduce Shelley, but I couldn't resist um, saying a couple of words about Robert. You have his bio, so I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Um, First, as m most of you know, uh, he played an important role as a fellow commissioner on the Evidence-Based Policy Commission, and he also helped move the legislation, the Foundations for Evidence-Based Policymaking Act, that's a, that's a mouthful, through Congress. Um, he continues his work as a principal at Grant Thornton, and you shouldn't hold it against him that he's an Astros fan particularly in light of the evidence-based outcomes that we recently observed. So here's a, a recent or an apt description of Robert from his LinkedIn page, and I quote, Public service is its own reward. I hope my three girls, Haley, Hannah, and Mimi, share my passion for helping government work better. Robert and Shelley, thank you. Um, Shelley is senior statistician at the Office of Management and Budget Statistical and Science Policy Branch. Um, she uh, leads the Federal Data Strategy Development Team, um, which maybe you can share something about. Um, uh, but she was also the executive director of the Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking. And if anybody uh, gets credit or blame for the accomplishments of that commission and enactment of the Foundations for Evidence-Based Policymaking Act, it is Shelley. She shepherded some of the most opinionated cats I've ever <laughs> seen. Um, so thank you very much for spending time with us and all of your work in this arena. So uh, the, let's start with, um, just so we can level set, uh, give us your description of, of both the requirements but also the spirit of the Foundations for Evidence-Based Policymaking Act. Thank you. Oh, you have uh, one. Uh, um, let me know if you can hear me. Um, so first I'll, I'll do a, a suggested shorthand. So at OMB, at least where I work, we've shorthanded the Foundations for Evidence-Based Policymaking Act as the Evidence Act just to save us a little bit of oxygen every time we, we talk about it. So I'll call it the Evidence Act if that's okay. Um, so as Robert and, and Bob have mentioned, first I will say one of the great professional honors of my life was being director of the commission, and these two were two of 15 uh, amazing people to work with. And yes, at times ornery and opinionated, but that's, that was the magic. And I, I would suggest you they probably wouldn't be collaborating today if they hadn't done the commission together. So, one of the really cool outcomes is what happens afterwards, right? These new partnerships that form. It's been fun to see those kind of things happening. Um, so the commission made uh, 22 recommendations to the president and the Congress, and the Evidence Act, in essence, uh, took up 10 of those 22 recommendations and turned them into law, which is pretty exciting to kind of see that whole progression um, uh, unfold. So I would say uh, the commission's vision kind of a writ large was that we would make the, the generation and use of evidence a routine part of government activities. Um, that it would no longer be the sort of heroic individualism or the um, exception or the ad hoc one-off wins, but it would become a much more routine thing. And underneath that, of course, is this idea of a really robust data infrastructure that supports the generation of evidence. So that data is of sufficient quality and sufficiently accessible and those kinds of things. So that's, I think, in a nutshell what the commission envisioned. And so the legislation, I think, took up that vision in a real way um, and had, I think, three kind of key 
parts to it. One was the idea of um, making formal and explicit the idea that we want to be asking big questions about mission and operations and agencies. So this idea of a learning agenda, <coughs> or what the uh, law calls an evidence-based uh, evidence building plan. So this idea that there will be a formal process that all agencies must, all large agencies must now undertake. Um, with stakeholder input and with an explicit planning process where they will write down the big questions where they want to develop evidence and we'll figure out what approach to take to get those questions addressed and what data are needed to do that. So that, that's brand new and that's going to really reset a lot of conversations because we can use those plans as a basis for setting priorities in a variety of ways, uh, data collection uh, priorities around the burden we impose on people budget priorities, um, all sorts of planning priorities. Um, and then another priority in the Evidence Act was making data accessible to the public. So this idea of open data, really emphasizing and, and putting into law uh, some policies and practices around data inventories and data catalogs and making sure that the public has access to more data. And then the third big thing that the law does is for those data that cannot be made public or open, uh, there's this uh, modernization and reauthorization of Speaker Ryan said last week at an event uh, of the Confidential Information Protection Statistical Efficiency Act, or SIPSI for short. So in the statistical uh, system space, we have this idea of the statistical agencies as these trusted intermediaries that are going to have uh, new authorities to acquire and uh, provide access to data. So for data that are restricted, for researchers, for evaluators, for other analysts, the statistical system is sort of stepping up its role to provide uh, more access to data for evidence building. So that's kind of the big picture of what the law does. And so where, how would you say we are? We're just a few months in since it's an enactment, really. It was enacted, signed in January. Where are agencies, the statistical community, OMB, in implementing the requirements of the law? question. So I kind of joke with folks, uh, the law was signed when the government was we had a partial lapse on appropriations, so I came back to work already very behind schedule. Um, we, we've, we've chosen, one thing I will say, we've chosen um, kind of an integrated implementation team, an implementation approach at OMB. So for those of you who got as far as Chapter 5 of the Commission Report, there is a recommendation informed by people like Bob and Robert who know OMB well. Uh, that says that OMB itself can be um, very siloed in the way it does its work and that that siloing can be reflected in how agencies organize themselves. So you have the CFOs talking to the OMB Financial Management Office, you have the CIOs talking to the CIOs Office at OMB, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a recommendation in the commission report to really do some silo busting, worded more elegantly than that. Um, <laughs> So OMB made a conscious choice, and I have to say this is, it's become a little bit of a joke inside OMB, but for about six months there, I would travel to meetings with three other people, always. We would travel as a pack. Um, we were demonstrating visually to our colleagues at OMB that the CIO's office, the, the uh, so-called evidence team, which is really a team that focuses a lot on program evaluation and the program evaluators, uh, OIRA, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, where I sit, where the chief statistician sits and has a lot of information, policy responsibility, our performance team, as well as some of our budget colleagues, we, we have been working weekly together on an implementation approach. So those of you who saw the guidance we put out in July, it was an integrated effort. Um, we talked about learning agendas and open data plans and uh, our plans for putting out the statistical regulations later, kind of all in a package. And that's been uh, a commitment across OMB that I think will hopefully will really bear fruit. So that's, I think, one tangible thing that maybe took a little longer, but we've been, we've been moving this forward together and not having one office say, oh, evaluation official is the most important official and a different office saying the chief data officer is the most important. No, this is a team effort at OMB. It's a team effort at the agency. So our guidance to agencies has been these three officials are going to be joined at the hip, and they're going to be the core cadre of people at agencies who will be implementing all the law's requirements. So to that end, we held a big orientation session in September for these officials. And I will say in terms of um, how I think it's going, I was really heartened. Uh, we had a lot of uh, these folks come for a half-day plenary session all together, um, heard some great talks, kind of heard from OMB leadership, how important we all saw this activity. And then they all came back for these two-day sessions. So chief data officers spent two days together, evaluation officials spent two days together, and statistical officials spent two days together, sort of constituting their own councils and learning 
about what the law requires and sort of what we already know about best practices. So they've been uh, trained and equipped and they've gone back to their agencies with their first homework assignment, which was um, setting up a data governance board, uh, which is something we are requiring of all the agencies uh, in our guidance. And the idea for this is that these people will sit together and instead of kind of worrying about whether that's in your job description or mine, really as a team trying to figure out the best way to set some priorities for the agencies to meet both the uh, open data requirements as well as the evidence building requirements around data and evidence. So uh, agencies were asked to submit um, updates on their activities in this regard with their FY21 uh, budget submission. What, uh, I know it's early, um, I think you're under strict obligation not to speak about this, but this is, you can ask we're me. all friends here, so <laughs> ignore the camera in the middle of the room. Um, what do you think we can expect to see in the budget this year in this arena? So I will say, for those of you who've ever worked in the federal government, and even if you haven't, it's just probably intuitive, um, budgets get formulated pretty early in the calendar year, and they go through a pretty lengthy uh, review process of agencies. So one thing I observed in looking at where agencies have submitted on B is, um, it was clear that a lot of those submissions had to be developed before the officials were even designated in July. Uh, by July was the deadline. And so they're messy. So they're missing. Yeah, see, and, and some of them, I think, you know, before those officials were trained, so they didn't have as clear an understanding of their roles as they do now. So I would say the submissions were very uneven. That's probably, you know, that's every year. I would say that, you know, we'll be in a much, I, I would think next year's are going to be much more of a, a great lead than this year's. Um, some agencies, you know, had a heads up. Uh, and so you'll see some agencies, agencies that you might expect, you know, were a little bit further ahead in their thinking. Um, we're, we're trying to make sure we do lots of good follow-up with R&D, um, kind of a small but mighty band. Uh, we're trying to use the budget process to be one more communications channel. I would say one nice thing about looking across on these silos is we're trying to look for how we use all of the different levers that are on B. So we have the regulatory review process, we have the information collection review process, we have the budget process, we have many processes, and if we can actually start thinking of this as a year-long conversation, I think we'll actually be better, better off than if we just do it once a year. The, uh, when you left the commission uh, to return to OMB, you took on a role leading the development of a federal data strategy, which has some intersection with the Evidence Act and evidence-based policy management, but it also brings in a lot of uh, other activities. Can you talk about uh, the federal data strategy, how it intersects, and uh, not how it doesn't, but, but what are some things that are tangential to that? Great question. So uh, the commission submitted its report in September of 2017, as required by law, kind of shut its doors at the end of September, and the Evidence Act uh, did not get enacted until January of 2019. So there was a, a substantial period of time there, about 15 months, where we didn't have the law, and uh, I think you know, some of us in the executive branch were hoping to find uh, kind of a venue to start this work even before we had a law that required it. So uh, for me, the federal data strategy, which is something that the Deputy Director for Management at OMB, a role that Robert used to hold. Um, the President's Management Agenda provided an opportunity to sort of lift up data and um, information and evidence uh, in that context. And so uh, our DBM, as we call Margaret Weicker, uh, recognized that data was really a, were a core piece of federal infrastructure and wanted to uh, create a data strategy around what she called leveraging data as a strategic asset. Uh, to grow the economy, to increase civic engagement, to help build evidence and so forth. So again, very complementary to what the, the law does. So we've spent uh, a year building a data strategy with a team of folks from 18 different agencies, uh, a lot of different disciplines, a very cross-silo kind of activity. So this was data not just for evidence building, but kind of data to improve operations, data to improve uh, transparency, those kinds of things. And uh, strategy itself is finished. We have a, our first year action plan that should be coming uh, out publicly hopefully later this month. Um, and you'll see in the action plan uh, sort of the federal government's data priorities for this year. Uh, some of those are priorities that we're asking all agencies to carry out and you'll see very close alignment on purpose with the Evidence Act because while we were busy crafting this, the law got signed. Uh, but then there are some other things where you'll see uh, what we're calling shared solution uh, actions, where a particular agency, such as the Commerce Department or 
uh, the GSA are taking on an action on behalf of the whole federal government. So they're creating a toolkit or some sort of resource that everyone else can use. Uh, so I think you'll see that's, again, very cross silo kind of thing. But the idea is that at the end of that year, we've got a, a much firmer data foundation built across government, and we've done some level setting there. And then each year after, we'll, we'll set some additional priorities that kind of build, um, really especially on the data infrastructure side. But but you'll see, and you saw in our graph, uh, references to learning agendas and other things. So we're trying to connect all of these dots for agencies. So I, I think you've answered the question, but do you see the data strategy strengthening the, or expanding the availability of, of data for use in rapid experimentation behavioral sciences. It, it should definitely have that effect, yeah. And um, can you share what concerns you most? What's the greatest risk that the government faces as it drives towards more evidence-based policy making? Um, I don't know if I have a nice inflection point now. I think uh, prior to now, I would have been concerned that this was being carried out on the backs of a few true believers, but it's not really institutionalized yet. I think we're at a nice point now where we can start to see it institutionalized. Uh, I remember when I was with the commission, um, with the staff, we all talked about what we would do next, and everyone said, you have to go back to OMB. Like, somebody has to go to OMB and make, actually work on this implementation. And I looked around, and I was actually the only person there from OMB, so it's like, okay, I guess it's me. Um, I think there was a sense that it was a very... Yeah, voted off the island or uh, on the island? Depends <laughs> on your perspective. Yeah. Uh, but I did feel kind of that calling to go back and try to get this stuff started. And, uh, you know, it was nice to find the kindred spirits. But I think we're, like I said, we're at this point now where I think we're going to have these uh, statutory officials who are really, I mean, it's very heartened to get at the orientation how seriously these career civil service were taking this new responsibility. And there's just one mostly folks who were... Um, either being dual-hatted or, or shifting from something else they had obviously been passionate about working on prior to that time. So uh, I think that had been a worry for me, but I think we're at a nice turning point. I guess the other uh, worry, which is also an opportunity, um, a lot of the work I do with, with restricted data access in the statistical system is around data protection. Uh, we are really at a high-risk moment in terms of identification risk for data that we've made available. Um, this is really core to public trust uh, in are handling very sensitive data. So again, I see this opportunity, but we do we have a lot of work to do here to make sure we can continue to make data accessible in a way that's safe and that maintain public trust. Otherwise, the kind of the whole enterprise gets a little shaky. Um, I'd like to open it up to some questions from the audience. Bob was serious when we want. He said we want to make this interactive. Can we get some questions from the audience for Shelley, who's got deeper insight into implementation of? <laughs> I was curious with the the, uh, the the data and evaluation people that have been assigned. It looks like at least the agencies that I'm familiar with very have full time jobs, and I'm wondering have they been re relieved of other duties so they could take this on, or this has been added on to their uh, current assignments? So I hope the folks in the room can hear. The question was, uh, are people agents in these new statutory roles? titles of the law and it's a little bit of cobbling together happens. So the evaluation official and the statistical official are responsibilities of all of what we call the CFO Act agencies or the large largest 24 agencies. The chief data officer is actually a requirement for all agencies. So something closer to 100 agencies so getting down to the very small agencies. So I think particularly for chief data officers, we expected and we have seen dual adding. And when we think about an agency that may only have 50 or 60 FTE, employees, it makes sense that people are going to have to dual hat it. So uh, it's, it's, it's not a surprise or necessarily a bad thing to see the dual hatting in some cases. I think for the larger agencies, we, we would hope to not see it as much of that. Um, I've, I've mostly seen people who either had, the, for example, the chief data officer title before, but it really was only a subset of the responsibilities that they now have under the law. So they've, they've grown the responsibilities, but they've continued to have that as their primary duty. Uh, for evaluation officials, and for evaluation officials, I think most of them are not dual headed. Most of them are uh, taking this on as full time. For statistical officials, actually, the law requires if you have a statistical agency in your department that the statistical agency head become the statistical official. I could go on for a long time about the kind of theory of action there, but um, with that dual heading is statutory, and the idea is the statistical agency is really the infrastructure underneath that statistical official to help with 
what's now department-wide role for evidence, uh, data for evidence building? I have seen uh, where the uh, evaluation official, official is dual-hatted with other responsibilities. They've got a, um, the duties are largely delegated to a, an individual with this as their chief responsibilities. So some of them are going to have staff right off the bat. Some will probably have staff eventually, but not right away. Yeah, I think a lot of these things are very actively trying to figure this out right now. Other questions? Yeah, John. You mentioned GSA and Commerce. Can you just mention a little bit more what are you expecting of them and in what offices in each of those departments will this sit? Yeah, so um, back to the data strategy for a minute. We've uh, been trying to use a very active uh, engagement strategy with the agencies and the public as we built the data strategy. And so <coughs> we put out a first year action plan in draft for comment a number of months ago. And if you were to go to our uh, website, strategy.data.gov, I always have to make sure I say that at least once at an event. Um, I get paid by the, by the mention, so I'm just kidding. Uh, um, if you go to look at the draft action plan, and hopefully the final will be there soon, you'll see, uh, for example, um, that we are building a data ethics framework, and that's something that we've uh, tasked GSA with being the lead. There's, a, there's language there about an interdisciplinary team that's doing this, providing a lot of subject matter expertise, and there'll be public engagement on that, but the data ethics framework was an example something we needed an individual agency to provide the leadership just to make sure it happens. Um, GSA is also working on kind of a data science catalog, a curriculum type of catalog. So again, just creating a resource for, for federal agencies who want to upskill uh, their, their staff in the data sciences. Uh, like what are those resources? Uh, some agencies such as Census Bureau and NIH have really active data science training programs for their staff. And so for the rest of the federal agencies to learn from that and hopefully benefit from what these agencies have already figured out. Uh, the Census Bureau is on tap to do you know, what the Evidence Act also requires, which is a single researcher application portal. This is something I think some of you will be very interested in. The law requires all the statistical agencies to participate, and other agencies with their uh, desire would be able to participate in a single portal. So if you are interested in the future in access to restricted data, so this is data that isn't just from the internet, uh, there'd be one place you can go uh, to apply and to see what, uh, what's available and how you might access it. But those are some examples. Anna, just let's go down this row. <laughs> Recognizing that we're moving in an evolutionary path over the next three years, how do you see OMB gradually increasing the rigor in which it looks for evidence in resource allocation? The holy grail. <laughs> so we're bringing Robert Shea back. Part 2.0. Is that the answer? <laughs> you didn't get a, Nobody booed. <laughs> I, I think we just floated your new idea, Robert. There you go. Uh, so I would say, um, so we actually went, a couple of us had a conversation before we started today about the idea of incentives. I think uh, for at OMB we've been thinking hard about um, all of our different levers, uh, and I do think this idea of working across our own silos and thinking about those different levers is going to be powerful. I think the next step is to think about incentives um, for agencies, I and mean, we want agencies to. To, we want them to be rewarded for doing a good job, but how, how do we do that? I think uh, today's budget process uh, at OMB is kind of by design a very pre-decisional and maybe not, a, it's by design not a very transparent process. So in my own experience, I've seen uh, past attempts to reward an agency are not always easy to communicate that they've been rewarded because they didn't know the pluses and the minuses that were happening all throughout the budget process at OMB. So, uh, I've literally had debates with people about where, you know, I, where I've said, no, no, I was there, I watched it. Like, this really is designed to be a new <coughs> set of funding for a new activity. So I, for me, it's a little hard to see how we do that in a way that's uh, very clear to agencies. So I think we need, we need to keep working on it. Um, and we need to obviously uh, have more conversations with Congress about what, what they would like to see in that space, too. So I, I do think it's an evolution. I think that's a great word. Um, I have to say it's been a lot of work to get to the point we are, so I feel like uh, those are the kind of conversations hopefully we can really start to have in the next year once we get past some of the initial deadlines. And uh, we still have 
haven't wanted to overemphasize the stuff on the statistical side, but we have uh, four regulations to put out in the next few months. So we are hard at work on a variety of things that are really going to, I think, modernize the data access uh, to the statistical system. But uh, that's a lot of my focus right now. So if you ask me in a few months, I'll be able to focus more on some of these other questions that I think are key to sustainability. Other question? Anyone? Bob? What would success, just since you've been so instrumental in this process, Shelley, what would success look like for you in the next year or two or three? And how would you define it or measure it? Good question. Um, I think see, it's about uh, for me, I think one thing would be to really uh, have a lot of the questions here have been around who's been designated and you know, are they are they able to have the bandwidth to do a good job and their responsibilities at the agencies. I think if we see, uh, if we're able to look back and say, okay, we have a cadre of people that we are really, we now have a professional cadre of chief data officers, evaluation officers, to school officials who uh, are working collaboratively with each other and you know, th this is now kind of a, an identifiable group and it just feels like it's got that sustainability to it and they are really, uh, collaborating with each other, and uh, we're seeing some data wins, uh, more and more of those. I mean, to me, that's what success looks like when it starts to move from OMB kind of like bird-dogging this, that the agencies are just embracing it and doing it. And, and I think we're already seeing that, but I think seeing that take hold much more across the board, especially for the large agencies. Basically, momentum. Thanks for spending. Oh, one more question. Is there a possibility, too, that a series would be developed to continue that process so that an actual, say in the GS series, uh, an actual uh, linear, some kind of trajectory where a so right, career path so that you can keep the uh, knowledge base and the actual science behind the development of training and so on, so that this isn't just a AU detail, it, it actually becomes a great so actually, the Evidence Act has a requirement in it that we uh, work with the Office of Personal Management on a sort of a job series around program evaluation, and, uh, something we've begun the conversations on. Uh, I guess the same folks at OPM who are working on that are also working on a data science of occupational series. So uh, I think we're kind of doing one first and then the other second. But the data science job series is something that's actively being discussed. I think we just got a little win a few months, a few weeks ago. Uh, now agencies are able to use data science in parentheses after like a, a job series like statistician or data analyst, policy analyst, something like that. So in OPM land, that's progress. Wow. <laughs> you would know better than me, but anyway, so now we can put that in the actual job announcements. And then uh, once we get past that, we'll work on the evaluation one. So I think that's uh, those are kind of already in flight. Uh, there could be more, but those are I think, the early ones. So I think, yeah, evaluators, I think it's been very important to them to see that this is a uh, recognized professional occupation and it's not just a social science uh, researcher or just a statistician. It's, it's kind of its own thing. It's got overlaps with those things, but that it has its own identity. It's more <coughs> Thanks for spending time with us and for your leadership. Good luck. Um, by way of background, ACF is a operating division of the Department of Health and Human Services. We are a human services agency. We promote the economic and social well-being of children, families, individuals, and communities. We're primarily a grant-making organization, so we have over 60 programs, and we generally give grants to states or other local entities to administer the programs. Major programs include child care subsidies for low-income families, Head Start, temporary assistance for needy families, child welfare, child support enforcement, and more. And our office, the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation, is charged with building and disseminating knowledge to improve ACF programs and um, examine innovative ways to serve the ACF population. So we do evaluations of existing ACF programs. We do evaluations of innovative approaches to helping the types of families that ACF serves. We do descriptive and exploratory studies, research syntheses. We work to improve the quality, usefulness, interoperability, availability, and analysis of ACF data. And we primarily conduct our research and evaluation work through um, competitively awarded grants and contracts. I'll be talking today about our Behavioral Interventions to Advance Self-Sufficiency, or BIAS, project. Um, this was a project that we launched in 2010, which was right around the time that I think behavioral economics was really bursting into the public policy mainstream. Um, it was launched the same year that the Behavioral Insights team began in the UK, um, a few years after the publication of Nudge by Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler. 
and we were seeing these examples, you know, you can make this small change to your program, it won't cost very much, it will be easy, and you can have a dramatic impact. So we were really excited to learn more about that. Um, but also skeptical, can nudge-like interventions work in the context of a grant-making federal agency where we don't have a great locus of control over a lot of how our programs get administered and we're serving families with very complex lives. Um, as I mentioned, we do most of our work through contracts and grants, so this project was led by MDRC with partners. And again, looking at the question, can insights from behavioral science be used to improve the operations and efficacy of human services programs and ultimately the well-being of the children and families that we serve? Um, this was an exploratory project, so we did a lot of groundwork, but I'm going to skip and tell you about the fun part, which is that we did 15 randomized control trials in seven states in three program areas. <laughs> work support um, in California, we worked with the TANF program in LA County. In New York, we worked with the Human Services Program. In both cases, we were trying to change the materials that people saw to encourage them to show up to meetings that were important for their program participation. In child support, we worked in two counties in Ohio trying to increase um, child support collections for parents who weren't getting their child support automatically withheld from their paycheck and also weren't receiving any reminders to pay. So we experimented with mailed letters, robocalls, text message reminders to get parents to pay child support. And in Texas and in Washington State, we worked on encouraging incarcerated non-custodial parents to apply to modify their child support so that they would lessen the risk of building arrears while they were incarcerated. In child care, we worked in both Oklahoma and Indiana on trying to improve the process of recertifying child care benefits so that neither parents nor providers would experience a lapse in subsidy. And in Indiana, we also worked to encourage parents who had child care subsidies to use them for higher quality child care programs. <coughs> So in all cases, just a few points to make. We weren't um, looking at kind of up and down, does this program work, does this program not work? You know, do childcare subsidies work, yes or no? But we were building evidence for iterative <laughs> program improvement. I'm gonna just walk through what we did in Los Angeles to give you an example of the type of work that we did. So in Los Angeles, we were working with the TANF program. They were facing a particular policy challenge, which is that some parents who had previously been exempt from work requirements needed to be re-engaged. So they were bringing them back in, and they were trying to contact these parents four times, and still only about half were showing up to this meeting, and we were trying to improve the show-up rate. If parents didn't show up and get re-engaged, they would face, the parents would face sanctions, and the program would spend a lot of money trying to track them down. So they were already getting a quite lengthy um, mailing that was um, mandated by the state of California, so we worked to send an additional mailing that would be personalized and simplified, try to... Um, encourage them to come in. So we did things like simplify the message, so making it very clear what is this meeting about, why do you have to come. Building an implementation prompt to help people plan to go to the meeting and also anticipate some hassles that may come up and think ahead about how to overcome them. So how will you get to your appointment? What are your child care plans? Try to plan ahead for these, these potential hassles. Um, we personalized the letters, so there was a sticky note that was from the caseworker, or appeared to be from the caseworker, that was saying, hi, you know, Jane, I'll see you at your appointment next week, see you, John. The idea was to create a sense of personalization, this meeting is for you, and also reciprocity to make people more likely to show up. Someone is waiting for me. Uh, we also experimented with framing the letters in a loss frame versus a gain frame. So among those who were receiving this behaviorally informed intervention, about half of them received a letter that said, if you don't come, you might miss out on jobs and you might lose your benefits. The other half received a letter that said, if you come, you can take advantage of job opportunities and keep your benefits. And the personalization was also either loss framed or gain framed. So then we did a randomized control trial and we found that receiving any behavioral notice increased re-engagement by about 3.6 percentage points. And that this was largely driven by the loss messaging um, The the gain frame was not statistically different than the control group, but the loss frame was. Uh, just a few things to say about this also. So TANF is a block grant to states. We don't have that much control over how it's administered. States can use the money for a broad variety of purposes, but this was a way that we could work to build evidence within that context. Um, so just as a reminder, so we did this 15 times over in all these different places, always testing, for the most part, communication. So can we change the letter that someone sees? Can we change the phone call that we can get? Can we provide a little bit of personalized assistance? And we were really encouraged by the results. So all of the sites saw a significant impact on at least one primary outcome of interest. 
The impacts were typically about two to four percentage points, which is what you saw in LA, although some were much larger. This is typical of the field. It's also commensurate with the program costs, which are typically about $4 per program group member. In LA, they were about $2 per program group member. <clears throat> so we think that while these were modest, they were also consistently achieved, very low cost, scalable, and we think that the small changes can add up both on a program level and also for the individual who might be participating in multiple programs. Um, because we thought this project was so much fun, we are doing more of it. So we have a uh, Bias Next Generation project. So we're trying to build on the lessons of bias and go beyond, both by working with additional ACF programs. So we're working with Child Welfare and Head Start. Also is trying to see if we can do more than just change the communications that people can see. Can we coach, for example, caseworkers to interact with their clients differently, give them a different script? Are there other ways that we can change program processes? Um, we also, for the past three years, have had a grant program supporting PhD students who are doing dissertation, dissertation research related to behavioral science and human services. Um, and you can learn more about all of this on our website. We have a newsletter you can sign up for. Um, you can follow us or the Center for Applied Behavioral Science at MGRC on Twitter. And I would love to answer questions. Great. Thanks, Emily. The, um, so Shelley talked a lot about the practical steps she's taking to help agencies implement the law. You've got a great story about uh, history of implementing this. One question I have is, who thought bias was a good acronym? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, how long? Uh, well, we thought it was extremely clever at the time, but it is a little bit controversial, it turns out. <laughs> the, uh, who, how long did this research take, and can you tell us a little bit about its ongoing impact on the program? Sure, that's a great question. So, um, one thing I, I wanted to mention was that this is, was really different for us than a lot of the traditional evaluations we would do, where, for example, someone be, would be participating in a jobs program, and then, you know, 18 months, 36 months, 60 months later, we would be looking to see were their earnings and employment impacted. Here we're looking to see, you know, 30 days later, did you show up to a meeting, or did you renew your child care subsidy this month? So in that way, it was really gratifying for us and for the programs that participated, because they were getting very real-time information about was this tweak that I made to my program effective? And how many? How much of your research has that very precise of a cost estimate of the intervention? So for in this project, we did have a cost, not a cost benefit, but a cost estimate for all of the interventions. Um, I can't say yeah, yeah. we, you know, we do that on a lot of our projects, but not all projects. All right, let's open it up to the audience. Questions? Yes, sir. You said about the small changes can add up, and that's sort of the hope for for behavioral applications, because they generally get small, these small effects. And the idea is, if we do lots of these cheap things, we'll get larger effects. But did any of the experiments actually test that whether there is an additive effect of adding these things one on top of the other? Yeah. So these were all in different places. Yeah. So there were different programs and different um, families participating. But I do think that's. The hope, and this gets back to part of your question I didn't answer before, which is that if we can go in and demonstrate that doing some kind of iterative program process like this works, then the programs are empowered to learn, oh, this rapid cycle experimentation is worthwhile, we can keep doing it, we can keep um, making small changes and testing them. Um, we had a convening at the end of BIAS, and all the programs that participated were there, and um, a woman from Franklin County Child Support Enforcement said, you know, we participated in bias and it changed everything. Like, it just changed how they looked at program improvement, testing, thinking about behavioral science. Well, so you, you answered my question a little bit, but how do you, what's the best way to get people to take these results seriously, just based on your experience, you know? You're engaged with them. I'm not sure the reason you're engaged on particular problems and I'd like you to comment on that. But I, how do you get folks to take these results seriously once you've actually done the hard work of figuring out what works? Okay, so I'll say a few things to answer um, your question. So, um, okay, so when we started, I think part of the skepticism we faced was, how is a nudge gonna make a difference for TANF? But the other part was, well, isn't this just common sense? Doesn't everyone know that you should write letters in plain or English? Um, and we said, no, apparently it's not common sense because a lot of human services program recipients are getting letters that are very hard to understand. So I do think that there's a value in having the experiment and just saying, you know, consistently we made small changes, we had a small impact. Um, in terms of kind of what can we make of this as a body of evidence and also why were all these, these idiosyncratic um, 
problems. So uh, here we, I didn't talk about something that I usually talk about, which is that we did this intentional behavioral diagnosis and design process where we were working with, um, we, we recruited sites who were interested in working on behavioral science and then they identified a particular local problem. So we didn't set out to um, answer questions that were going to be broadly applicable. We were just trying to say, who's interested in testing these behavioral insights will work with you on a particular problem that you have. Um, in the next round, we did do some stakeholder input to try to say, okay, if we're going to test um, something in TANF, can we try to get a few sites to try to solve a similar problem that is does have wide applicability? So that said, we did also, something I usually talk about but didn't because this is a lightning round, so in the end, uh, we did look back at the end of bias and say, okay, broadly we solved different problems, we had similar impacts, were there common interventions that we used? Um, and we came up with a mnemonic simpler, which has seven letters, so there were seven interventions. Um, social influence, implementation prompts, personalization, loss aversion, ease, and reminders. And we said, you know, this is just looking back at the set of experiments, but this is kind of what we pulled out as the common interventions that we tended to use. One last one. Yes. Uh, well, it's kind of a two-part question, so apologies up front. One, what were some of the pitfalls uh, what, as you went through the process that you found? Two, what were some of the surprising uh, benefits and or failures that you found? Okay, so, um, you know, we said this was rapid cycle evaluation, but it's all relative. Um, it does take a long time sometimes to change a form. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, the promise is that this is so quick and easy, but in reality, you know, we're working in government programs, we're trying to change processes. Even if the intervention at the end of the day is simple, it can take a while to get there. Um, so that was the pitfalls. What was your second question? The other one are some surprising both, uh, uh, successes and failures. Yeah, I mean, I think people were really excited to participate in this study. It was just, we had so much more energy around sites wanting to participate than we normally do. So um, just backing up a little bit, I mentioned we're a grant-making organization. We don't have a ton of control over the programs that we administer, so we're always recruiting sites to participate in our studies. It was much easier to do at this time. People were excited about this work. And I think they, t again, took from it, you know, I can I can take this work forward on my own. This isn't this huge program that I need external TA to implement. I can keep thinking about how to make small changes and iteratively improve my program. One more question. Yeah. Recognizing that you're a big making institution and that you're doing small tests and learns, what in your regulatory framework either helps or inhibits your ability to proliferate things that prove to be successful. Okay, so I, we, we've given, we think about this a lot, like how do we know that we're doing all these tests and they're getting out there? So I think there's basically three ways that ACF can get this evidence out in the world. One is through our funding opportunity announcement, so we can, um, just totally different example for our Health Profession Opportunities Grant, we have a big research and evaluation portfolio. We can take what we learned and then emphasize different things in the next funding round. Um, the second is regulations. So recently, uh, relatively recently, um, writing regulations for the reauthorized um, CCDBG and can draw on all of the research that we do on child care quality and access, et cetera. Um, and then the third, I think, is where bias comes in, which is just, you know, we talk about it a lot and then our programs are excited about the idea of applying behavioral insights to their programs. And so all of the work that we do to put our research out there, we hope gets out into the field. Great. Thank you very much. It's uh, uh, very cool to get a chance to talk to this group uh, and give some uh, insights into, I think, well, I'm going to provide an example also about TANF, which we didn't coordinate. Uh, I think what I may be able to provide for this group um, is just a few insights into how you might be able to think about constructing evidence-based teams either within uh, federal agencies or what you might want to be looking for and how states are actually implementing these things when uh, we are trying to have evidence filter throughout everything that we do. So both things that you can control at the federal level and also things that, um, that you would like to see other states and other jurisdictions. Um, but I am going to start a timer to keep myself accountable for this, so, for that 10 minutes, so because I could talk about this all day. Um, so very quickly, um, just give an intro to the lab at DC and talk a little bit about how we op are operationalizing evidence-based policy in DC. 
Uh, we work in the mayor's office, uh, specifically in the office of the city administrator. Uh, it's not really an analogous office in the federal government or in a lot of states or cities, uh, but essentially all of the different agencies that aren't independent in the district report up to the city administrator. And uh, we work in the city administrator's office, and it's a really nice place to be able to both catch kind of the priorities that are coming down from the mayor and also the challenges and opportunities that are coming up from agencies. So we work across things like crime, health, uh, services, uh, kind of like city services, education, anywhere we kind of have the purview to work in anywhere, any space in terms of policy, which is great in my mind. Uh, the way that we think about this is not that we have great ideas, um, even though we have some folks with a lot of experience in research uh, across a broad variety of fields. We think that it's much more about doing this work as creating these cycles that are going to lead to better outcome for district residents in the long term. And I think that aspect of evidence-based policy can get lost sometimes is why we are doing this. We are not doing this because uh, people think it's a good idea or people at universities <coughs> think we ought to be thinking about things this way, but that it's actually going to lead in the long run to better outcomes on things that we really care about. And I would argue from my perspective that because we haven't been doing approaches like this long term, that's one of the reasons why we have these problems that we think are intractable, but really aren't. Uh, and so what the lab at DC is set up to do is not to do everything or not to provide tons of new ideas, but to help the people who are implementing uh, throughout district government engage in cycles that we think are going to lead to better outcomes. And so. We think that that's essentially the scientific method, but it is also what is essential to good government. And if you would ask anyone what good government is, you would say that they, they would tend to say something along the lines of, well, you should be listening uh, to your constituents or the people that matter about what you should be working on and make sure that that's their priorities. When you're doing something new, you should design that based on the best knowledge available, uh, including knowledge of the data that we already have to really scope out a problem. Uh, you should then do something with that design and make sure that you're doing it well and that you're paying attention to implementing things and also treating your residents in our case uh, like we really value their time and think of them as humans uh, and not you know all econs or lawyers or anything like that who might be able to follow uh, very dense forms and things like that but uh, but really that we're designing things well and implementing them well and then importantly testing those things out uh, rigorously and using the best methods from science that we possibly can, uh, then we get the results. We need to decide what to do with them. Um, and that is not a simple decision in many cases of the evidence says this, definitely do it, but we need to think about it in the context of uh, what is possible, what is feasible in terms of funding, and even, yes, what is politically uh, appropriate for us to be able to do within a system. So that is not a simple decision based on what the evidence says. Uh, and then importantly, and I think this gets to a lot of the things that we're talking about, is that we need to know that whether we're doing something large or small, that it's really unlikely that we are going to solve these large challenges with one thing. Uh, we work in issues like gun violence, homelessness, housing instability, uh, public health. Uh, these are things, challenges that we are not going to solve with one thing, so we need to go into them not expecting any silver bullets, but that we are going to need to repeat these processes over time if we're actually going to move the needle. But importantly, we're going to be doing that with knowledge of what is working and what is not. Um, so the example I'm going to give is going to focus kind of a lot on uh, this design, uh, test, and decide part of the process. Uh, very broadly, how we do evidence-based policy in the lab is we have four specific areas of work. Uh, we do randomized evaluations, uh, we do predictive modeling, a very good way to use data to benefit residents. We do resident-centered design, which gets more to that kind of treating our residents like humans aspect of it. And what underlies all of that is the use of administrative data uh, to do any of these parts of the cycle that I mentioned. As I mentioned before, we work across all different areas of policy. Uh, and on interventions large and small. So we work on emails and text messages, but we also work on multi-million dollar program evaluations. And the folks that are doing it, this is just a snippet from our website. Um, there are uh, folks that are actually both implement, helping implement the programs, do some of the bureaucratic stuff, but also uh, running the evaluations and conducting the research. And I think I'll, I'll stop on this for one second just to say that uh, the 
In order to construct a team that can do this, we realize that we need people with lots of different skill sets. So we need social scientists, we need people who know the research and know the methods, we need data scientists, uh, people who can actually work with the data and figure out uh, how do we connect systems and data that is, was not designed to be connected or used for a research or evaluation. Um, but we also need people who care about operations and understanding things. So if we are going to get a pilot off the ground, we need somebody who is going to be able to dig in uh, to the processes of how someone enrolls in a program or doesn't. Or how do we procure, um, say, Metro cards for an intervention or Uber ride credits or anything like that. And that operations aspect of it can get lost in a lot of ways. And so I, if you're looking within agencies and also within different jurisdictions, I think for one, one of the biggest things that we've learned is that it's not just researchers who need to do this or data scientists. We really need to take care of the operations of actually getting these things done. Um, and so we staff our team uh, with that. We also have a podcast intern as well, so um, <laughs> who I noticed is on here. So I'm going to give a very quick example, and I, I thank Emily because I was able to spend a little bit more on what the team does and the structure, and hopefully that fills in some gaps because I'm going to present an example uh, from some of my staff members and former colleagues on TANF <laughs> um, in the D.C. area, so thank you for doing some of the groundwork for me. It's also a behavioral science intervention, so uh, all of that is there. Uh, the one thing that I'll highlight on this page is a couple of things. Uh, one, like I said, this is work for my colleagues, so any errors introduced are my own. Um, but also there's links to our project page on this and the pre-analysis plan, which is on the open science framework uh, and the final report. Uh, so as Emily said, uh, TANF is a block grant. Uh, specifically in D.C., it serves about 12,000 families uh, on the rolls throughout the year. It's about 4% of D.C.'s population. Uh, it's predominantly, if you live in the district, in wards 7 and 8, um, which are, at least in the last half century or so, some of the more disadvantaged areas of the city. Um, and, the, uh, and it's really one of the key aspects of our social safety net here in D.C. because we can administer it through a mixture of both the federal block grant and local funds. We have a very generous TANF program, and in fact, it wasn't until 2017 that we actually required a recertification for the program uh, for most of the people in it. Um, but what that requirement created was a challenge in that some people were not recertifying for it. Um, and because they weren't recertifying for TANF, they weren't maintaining continuous benefits. Um, and also for some people, because the eligibility rules to maintain benefits are less stringent in terms of income and other things than the ones to get benefits to begin with, there's actually people who can lose out on benefits that they would otherwise have if they recertified. Um, and also for the agency, uh, the Department of Human Services, who's wonderful and we do a ton of work with, who implement these um, recertification process. If we have to recertify people or have people fall off the rolls, it's a lot of administrative overhead as well. So it's a benefit to both the families and the administration. So it's important that we encourage recertification. Uh, but it's also important that we understand if this is a problem that we can actually move. So we looked at some of the administrative data beforehand to say, Okay, we've got about a 50% recertification rate. Uh, is that accurate? Does that just mean only 50% of people are kind of coming off the rolls of TANF each year? Uh, but we looked at some of the data and what we found was that in fact, about 17% of the people who failed to recertify were coming back in to start benefits anew. And so this wedge here, the 17%, we at least know really could have benefited from uh, recertification. So there's something in the behavior there that we want to be able to try and uh, kind of assist with. So what did we do? We tested something. We looked deeply into the process uh, and came up with an intervention. This is the standard communication. It is nine pages long. Uh, it, no, it's 11 pages long. Excuse me, I didn't give it credit. Uh, it also starts with a whole lot of legal language that tells the resident why we might be wrong that they are up for certification and doesn't really highlight some of the important information. Uh, we left that letter aside and allowed everybody to still get it because there's a lot of legal reasons for it. Uh, but we did what we did instead is layer on this behaviorally informed letter. And so we put we took a random group of people who are up for reapplication over five months and sent them this additional letter, which highlights some of these similar aspects of behavioral science that Emily mentioned. So we make a clear statement about what people are actually going to need to do. Uh, we encourage things like planning planning intentions to make people think about how they will get to recertify, 
things like check boxes and also map out their trip for them. So similar inf information are on a similar measure, and so it's good to see these things uh, being tried in multiple ways. And in our instance here, also see that it's working in multiple ways. And so when we just had the standard uh, letter, we saw about a 40% recertification rate. Uh, and then when we did this behavioral informed reminder letter, we saw a six percentage point increase um, in the percentage of people who were recertified. I know I'm out of time. So what that translated to was over 750 families maintaining their benefits in a given year in the district. Um, we were able to roll this out to everyone in a relatively short period of time. It took about uh, seven or eight months between the end of the study to when we were actually sending it to everyone. Um, and then very importantly, when we talk about deciding what to do with them, uh, we both decided to expand this letter to all families, or Department of Human Services did, uh, and they also decided that they would use a similar template to email the ten, to send out letters to the tens of thousands of families who are using SNAP, Supplemental and Nutrition Assistance, uh, in the district. So taking almost the exact same template, playing with the color scheme, and sending it out to more people. So with that, I will take in questions. Fantastic. Um, great example. Wild that it's a Santa fun. Um, <laughs> questions for Sam. <Santa. coughs> So you obviously have limited resources at the lab. How do you prioritize what projects you take on? Yeah, I think that, that really fits in the, the listen stage of what we do, which is that we try to make sure that if we can, the projects we're engaging in are ones that we know, uh, essentially through the democratic process, are priorities for district residents. Um, and through that, we think that's where they're going to have the most impact on DC. And so that's kind of our first filter of, is this a big deal? And so that's why things like homelessness, uh, public safety, um, education, school attendance show up in our portfolio a lot. Uh, but then it's also the very real aspects of this is, do we have the tools to be able to answer a question uh, in a time frame that someone can make a decision on and with a level of confidence that we as scientists can actually trust. Um, and so there's a lot of more details going into that to say like, okay, what's the time frame? Can we give a good answer? Can we do random assignment or something that's going to closely approximate it? And so doing that filtering. And so when we started, we had to be focused much more on what can we deliver results on because you know we were new and feeling out different opportunities. And as we've matured in district government and become more well known, we've been able to lean more towards that first filter, which is, is this a priority? Um, and so that's how we tend to think about it. And then we have a whole process that I'd be happy to share with anyone about how we actually suss out those things. Yeah, that'd be great. And please feel free to email me if, uh, if any materials would be useful. Other questions? Yes, sir. So we've seen two sets of communication experiments. Mm -hmm. When you look at behavioral insights, it's lots of communication experiments. One, because it's cheap, but I also wonder is it because it's easier to randomize? It's hard to get program people to do anything but randomize how they do outreach and communication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I mean it is, but it's it's almost it's especially early on in an organization. It's almost never easy to randomize anything, and so that's why I think the when you talk about these as as rapid cycle experiments, the rapid thing is is within context. Um, so I think it is, yeah, a great place to start. I think of it uh, oftentimes as like a bit of a gateway drug to testing. Um, and Kevin Donahue, who was the um, who led the Performance Improvement Council uh, in the Obama administration, is now the Deputy Mayor for Public Safety and Justice in the Bowser administration in D.C., said that when he was helping doing some of this work at the federal level with the White House Social and Behavioral Sciences team, which um, he was saying, like, really, like, the thing that was useful wasn't so much the behavioral science, but to be able to be in a room with people to say, like, we don't need to nail this and pick the exact thing that is going to work. We can try a few things and learn from the results. And I think that's what gets people thinking about it. Um, and then I think it's also uh, framing things around, like, we need to give you the best ability to make a decision, uh, and this is how we think we can do it. So, so this certainly works as a gateway, but it's the same approach and same methods, whether you're talking about an email or you're talking about uh, a rental subsidy program. Other questions? This is a follow-up. Yeah. You have the floor. Was the program interested in doing a follow-up after you did that experiment? Uh, yes. So the so we would have actually, you know, full disclosure, I would have loved to actually test out the TANF mailers before they decided to kind of 
buy or sorry the snap mailers before they decided to buy into sending it to all you know tens of thousands of snap families uh, snap recipients in the district uh, but we are doing much more work with them in the TANF space going forward so we as a, a, a very good example actually I think of that is we started out with the mailers our current project with them that we're working on most closely is around uh, a specific type of coaching intervention for families in TANF to be able to allow them to either to fulfill their job um, their uh, job search activity and education activity requirements. I'm not getting the word right for that, I apologize. Uh, but being able to actually coach, take a different approach to the case manager client interaction to be more of a coach and less kind of an overseer. And so with um, the Economic Security Administration in DHS, we're doing that and we also have commitments at least early on to do that as a randomized experiment as well. So you get from the little bit of like let's do a nudge letter to like let's do this for something bigger and much more intensive. Recognizing you're dealing with a whole battery of agencies with very different missions, <coughs> how do how is your work governed relative between the agencies, the mayor's office, and your own sort of learning agenda? Mm -hmm. Um, so we, we have a wonderful amount of autonomy, I think, uh, and we have. Uh, there's, it's a double-edged sword because you need people to value what you're doing. But um, So we've been uh, given a lot of leeway by the city administrator and the mayor to be able to like figure out how you can make this stuff work. Um, and so we mostly follow those same principles that I, that I laid out as we, we can kind of figure out what are the priorities and where we can help. Um, but we're also increasingly involved in the budget process. My boss is the budget director for the district. And so um, now we are trying to orient our decision making about when we do things and the projects that we have so that if we can feed something into our budget cycle, we are trying to do it in that way. And so we're, we're trying to use that as kind of a, a backbone of what we are doing, both in terms of working, identifying opportunities for agencies to test things and also to um, and also to use our work that we've previously done to inform the budget decisions. So it's not like an explicit mandate in any way, but we but it is giving a little bit more structure to how we um, how we take projects and how we um, work with agencies. Sam, you're not the only local lab in the country. Can you talk about the network of labs doing <coughs> stuff like you're doing and how that collaboration is going? Sure. Um, so there's a lot of so the our initial seed funding is from the Lauren John Arnold Foundation. So uh, I'll now called Arnold Ventures, um, although I get the corporate governance kind of mixed up of what's what now. Uh, but they funded uh, I think they're up up to ten uh, policy labs uh, across the country. Some of the ones that people may be very familiar with, like the Urban Labs at University of Chicago, or the California Policy Labs, but also ones in. Um, in Texas, in Rhode Island, and several other places. And so those are all university-based ones that work with the state or local jurisdictions, but it's a full network of people trying to do this similar stuff. Um, and then there's also examples in like New York City of the um, Center for Economic Opportunity doing this sort of work uh, in the Bloomberg administration. Uh, there's also several other non-Arnold uh, centers um, that are at universities but work really well with jurisdictions like the Lab for Economic Opportunity at Notre Dame. Um, but uh, unfortunately for the time being, I don't think there are many teams, if all, at, that have as big of a footprint in a state or local government as the lab does. Although we're excited to see, particularly at the state level in Minnesota um, and other places where people are starting to invest in these sorts of in these sorts of so, so it's exciting. We, we don't want to be an outlier for long um, and hope that we can provide good learning from our successes and failures for people to develop them more. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me to be here today. I don't have any slides, but I did bring some good examples to share with you all. Uh, the Department of Education is doing a lot of great work uh, in this evidence space. We have the National Center for Education Statistics, uh, Institute for Education Sciences. We have a What Works Clearinghouse. Uh, within federal student aid where I work, we have something called the Experimental Sites Initiative. Uh, I'm not going to talk about any of that uh, right now. <laughs> I am going to focus on what we have done in the past couple of years. Uh, to try to apply behavioral insights um, to a lot of our outreach efforts for student loan borrowers uh, and also for applicants uh, for federal student aid. 
um, talk about what we have learned through that and how we've tried to institutionalize some of those learnings. Um, so I am at uh, the Office of Federal Student Aid within the Department of Education. Uh, it is the largest office in the department and we provide around $120 billion of student financial aid in the form of grants, work study, uh, and loans um, to approximately 13 million students each year. Uh, we've got over 42 million student loan borrowers, um, so the scope of what we're working with is really large. And when we talk about changes that we want to make uh, for our customers, uh, it is wise for us to start small and to do testing rather than scaling everything up at one time. So that's where a lot of the value of, of this has been for us. With the size of our student loan portfolio, we are essentially uh, one of the top 10 uh, largest banks in the country. <coughs> We were designated as a performance-based organization in 1998. Um, we're one of three in the federal government. The others are the Patent and Trademark Office within the Department of Commerce uh, and the Air Traffic Organization within the FAA. Uh, the structure is supposed to make federal student aid operate a little bit more like the private sector and to have a clear focus on strategic outcomes uh, or strategic planning and on measuring our outcomes. Uh, I have been with the department almost 13 years now and I started out uh, at the Office of Post-Secondary Education, where we were overseeing a lot of the grant programs um, and doing more of the larger program evaluations that you know would take many years to set up, um, you know, trying to prove that the, that those programs were working well. When I came over to Federal Student Aid, um, I started out in our customer analytics group, um, and the focus was on much more short-term. Um, evidence that we were able to collect on the outcomes of our programs. Um, so going from, you know, being able to plan and do things over many years to show that something's working and trying to condense that down into what, what can we find out that is working right now and how do we operationalize it quickly. Um, so things do move very quickly in our office. Um, sometimes we have to make decisions and we don't have enough information. Um, so we, we've turned to some of the um, some A-B testing, some randomized controlled trials um, that we have done with borrower communications that I would say has saved us a lot of time, has saved us a lot of money. Um, I, I find a lot of value in what we have done well, but also the areas in which we have failed. Um, because when we have tried something out and it has not worked or it has had the opposite effect of what we intended, um, the fact that we did not commit funds to, to roll that out, I think is, a, is a valuable. Um, it's also very hard to get support for new initiatives. so. With our pilot approach of doing rapid experimentation and demonstrating results on a small scale, it's a good way for us to win support for doing some of those things on a larger scale. Um, so we have really, over the last couple of years, tried to ramp up our communications uh, to student loan borrowers to help them understand their repayment options. Uh, our surveys show that borrowers have very limited understanding about their options for repaying their loans. Um, just out of curiosity, do any of you have student loans or have children who have student loans currently? Okay, um, a large percentage of the population does. It's a, it's a thing that really weighs on people and there are too many options for how you repay your loans. Um, so we know from behavioral science, like decision fatigue and having too many choices really overwhelm people. Uh, so a lot of what we have tried to do is look at all of the data, look at who is more likely to choose specific loan repayment plans, for example, um, and try to personalize communication so that we're reaching out to people who are likely to take the action that we think would, would benefit them and make sure that they have the information that they need. Uh, once a student graduates or leaves school, they get a six-month grace period where they have to start paying back their loans. Uh, if they don't take any action, they get put in the standard 10-year repayment plan. Uh, where the payment that you have as soon as you graduate is the same payment that you will have nine years from now and hopefully you have a better paying job. Um, but if they take an action, they can do things like repaying their loans on an income-driven repayment plan that makes it more affordable. Um, so if they are on a more affordable repayment plan, then they're <coughs> less likely to go delinquent or to default, which is one of our main priorities. Um, so we did some A-B tests, um, some randomized controlled trials where we had a control group and we had two different messages uh, and we tested the best timing for sending out the information about student loan repayment options. Uh, we did it when a borrower first goes into their grace period and they have six months and then we did it sort of each month and towards the end and tried to see you know, what messages resonated with which borrowers and then also what, what timing made most difference. Um, and we found 
probably won't surprise you is that people procrastinate and they don't want to make a decision until right until the last minute. Mm -hmm. And so the people who actually responded to our messages, it was right before they had to make their first payment. Um, so we, based on those tests and based on the messages that we have tested with different segments, we now have different messages going out. Um, but they all go out right before someone goes into repayment rather than at the beginning of their grace period. Um, so that's one example of where we were able to do some testing um, and then operationalize that. Um, we've done some of these uh, randomized controlled tests with uh, other examples. So the FAFSA, um, we have about 25 million students and parents each year that get communications about their free application for federal student aid. Um, the number of emails that we send out each year, it's almost 100 million. Um, and up until a few years ago, we didn't have a lot of ability to test some of those messages. Um, but in recent years, we have been able to do testing on things like uh, state deadlines um, and trying to make those salient. Um, we've done testing related to text messages and seen if emails make more of a difference or if text messages make more of a difference depending on the age group. Um, or depending on some other things about um, some of these applicants. Uh, we've done other uh, studies uh, on defaulted borrowers where we have tried to look at framing effects and whether or not it helps for us to tell people who haven't made payments on their loans, uh, hey, don't worry, we're here to help. You know, there are ways for you to get out of default. Or does it work better to frame it and say, there are very serious consequences for being in default, and if you do not take action, here are the following things that are going to happen to you. Um, we had done a lot of surveys where we found that defaulted borrowers would tell us that they preferred that more positive messaging. We had all these different survey questions, and we were trying to figure out like what, what was it that would actually resonate with people and get people to take an action. Um, and it was interesting to me, having worked on a lot of those surveys, to then find out when we actually tested those messages and followed up to look at what actions people were taking, that it was actually the really negative framing that, that scared people into action. Um, and if we had the more positive framing, people would not respond. Um, so we would get calls to the call center, we would get people going to the website, we would get people trying to rehabilitate their loans if they had that more negative framing effect. Um, so that was a surprise to some people, uh, not to others. Um, but what we, we've been able to do is take a lot of people's hypotheses of you know, what works to reach our customers and to show um, whether or not that bears out in reality or not. Um, we, we did something similar to some of the examples that you heard from earlier with our tax offset program, uh, where if you have not paid your loans and you've gone into default, at one point the government will come and take your tax refund. Um, and we get a lot of calls around that time on social media, people complain a lot. Um, we tried to change that messaging um, because people felt like they weren't getting enough advance warning about it. And we tried to change the messaging, but we were told from our operations folks that it's too difficult, it's too expensive, like we're not, we're not going to do that. So we took a similar approach that you all described uh, earlier where we just put something on top of it. Um, so we came up with, okay, here's all the, the jargon that's currently in the letter. We're going to put something in plain language and just add it on top, which was a lot easier for us to operationalize and then see if that worked or not. Um, and that was one way to do a test that then we could prove that this was something that was worthwhile to invest in and to go through the process of saying, we need budget for this, we need to make the change with the contract, and all of that. So um, these are some of the examples of how we've been able to do low-cost experimentation and how we've been able to apply behavioral insights um, into the design of our products and services. Um, we continue to learn from the data to make improvements for our customers. Uh, I would say that some of the most important things we have done after doing many of these experiments over the years is we've tried to hire people um, to come do this full time um, and we've tried to make it a priority within the organization um, and institutionalizing a lot of this has been one of our challenges and something that we really focus on because I think we've proved that this work has had a lot of value and now it's a, a, for us an issue of being able to have the tools to do this well and to do this at a low cost um, and then to have the organizational support and the people dedicated to, to do it long term. So um, with that, I will take your questions. Great. Um, talk, can you talk a little bit more about the ebb and flow, how to get leadership commitments to this and sustain that over time? Yes. Uh, I think we have um, had to do a lot of communication of the outcomes of some of these studies um, and make sure that leadership is aware of that. Uh, one thing that we've 
we've ended up finding helpful is to share some of our failures um, and to, to essentially communicate that if we are trying to do something on a really large scale that it is worthwhile for us to test it first before we do that um, to make sure that it works before um, we do it for a large number of our customers. Uh, so we, one thing that we keep talking about in terms of our goals right now because we're going through sort of an organizational transformation is operational flexibility uh, and that we need tools that allow us to have that kind of flexibility to do these tests. So we, uh, a year or two ago, purchased something called the Salesforce Marketing Cloud that has A-B testing built into it for our communications. So before we were doing a lot of this manually, we were having um, some of our statisticians pull data, we were assigning people to different groups, we were doing all of these tests manually, um, it would take longer than we wanted it to, uh, but then we were able to uh, get a tool that did this for us automatically and it really shortened the time period. Um, so we spent some time doing all the market research, uh, presenting that to leadership and uh, showing that for our previous experiments what the value of that had been and then trying to get support for it to be an investment for something that we do long term. Uh, we're, at, we're now moving to a different tool uh, that is FedRAMP compliant because that one was not. Mm. Um, but it also has the A-B testing tools so that we can do this kind of rapid experimentation um, with our customers. What's that tool? Can you share? Uh, Adobe Campaign is what we're currently working on. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone has experience with that. <coughs> Other questions for Jessica? No questions? Just kind of yeah. cutting into my own time, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, all these, the results from all these A-B testing, do you report them in some place where other people could learn? We do, and thank you. I should have mentioned that. Um, so we have worked with what is now at, uh, GSA's Office of Evaluation Sciences, and we have a number of abstracts that are on their website. So if you go to the Office of Evaluation Sciences um, and you search for education, uh, you will find a lot of the abstracts that we, uh, for some of the studies that we've done. And that's, there's stuff about, about the FAFSA, um, about income driven repayment plans, about uh, delinquent borrowers, defaulted borrowers, I think in borrowers who are likely to withdraw from school. Those are some of the main studies. Not everybody may know about the Office of Evaluation yeah. Sciences. Do you want to explain how you access them for support? Sure. Uh, so at one point they were the White House Social and Behavioral Sciences team, um, and they are now at GSA and uh, called the Office of Evaluation Sciences. They have fellows who um, come into government for a period of time, and we actually have someone um, from their office that is working with us on a part-time basis, uh, and so that has been really valuable to bring in that expertise. Uh, and we, we had done that many years ago, and we, we had had a whole team of people actually who had been working with us. Uh, and the idea was, you know, for them to sort of teach us how to do that ourselves and how to operationalize that and do it in, over the long term. Um, but we've continued to rely on them for support for bringing their most recent research and giving us ideas of things that we might want to test. Um, but I know that they, they work with a number of different federal agencies and have done so very successfully. Other questions? Anyone? Is that a hand raised here in the front? Oh, yes. <laughs> Okay, so the question is how many colleges and universities have federal grant programs? Um, so there's around 6,000 colleges and universities in the country. Um, most of them are, uh, they apply to be in the Title IV program, which is federal financial aid. Uh, and we have a federal grant program called the Pell Grant Program that is for students who are low income. Um, and then there are other grant programs that colleges or that states offer as well. But the way that you are able to access that financial aid is to apply through the FAFSA, is the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. And that's how you find out if you're eligible for those programs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. So. I've got, I'm going to focus on domestic work, uh, but I've, I've been working on evidence-based policy in the environmental sphere for a long time, trying to get federal state agencies, multilateral international groups, NGOs to focus on generating evidence. We've got long-running debates in the environmental field that have gone for decades with no evidence, just anecdotes on both sides. 
Uh, so I run two centers, CBEAR and EPIC, a co-direct CBEAR with Kent Messer at University of Delaware and EPICS at Hopkins. They both work in the environmental sphere. CBEAR works on the agricultural side, EPIC works on everything else and works internationally. Uh, and they both have the same mission, bring insights from the behavioral sciences to environmental programs. This idea that environmental programs are human behavior programs, like a lot of other social problems. And what you often get in lots of fields, but particularly in the environmental, scientific lens gets posed to things like, what's the chemistry in the atmosphere? Is this toxic? What's the quality of our water and agriculture? It's different crops and pesticides. But when it comes to actually influencing outcomes, there's no scientific lens put on to that activity. It's just, oh, we think that any farmers talk to other farmers, that will work. Or we just put some standards on the environmental uh, processes and that will work for uh, getting environmental gains. So we trying to bring all these insights from the behavioral sciences, broadly speaking, psychology, uh, economics, neuroscience, sociology, to the program designs. And then the second piece is getting them to test it. It's created this culture of experimentation environmental programs, uh, which doesn't exist at all, uh, and we're still working quite hard uh, on that. So domestically, CBEAR gets funding from U.S. Department of Agriculture and works in that space with its state and local partners. EPIC used to get funding from EPA, does not anymore, uh, but still has EPA as a major stakeholder. And we also have other stakeholders like state departments of the environment uh, and NGOs and Nature Conservancy. <coughs> In the agricultural space, we focus largely on voluntary programs, because in the US, we don't force farmers to do really anything. EPA, we focus largely on compliance and enforcement experiments, uh, where we're trying to improve uh, environmental outcomes, so very similar to what you might do in the tax compliance space, or OSHA might do in the safety space. Uh, think about different ways of implementing enforcement uh, and compliance. What we also try to do is get these experiments are lined up with these underlying debates that uh, run through these agencies so that we can start shedding light on these competing ideas about what's going on in their particular domain. So in the USDA, in the voluntary programs, there's been a long-running debate. Is it just that we have to give farmers more money so that they will generate these environmental goods, clean up the Chesapeake Bay, or is it that they need these other things? And the other things might be education, they might need uh, different kinds of technical assistance. They might need nudges and also reducing the paperwork and transactions. So there's these sort of twin ideas that farmers are perfectly rational. If they're not doing it, they just need more money. Or farmers are just like everybody else and they need reminders. They need different framing and they need technical assistance and education. Those are sort of the twin activities, and they're sort of schizophrenic, where they've got programs designed as if farmers are perfectly rational, they have programs designed as if they're not, uh, and they don't really seem to elucidate under what conditions are those two competing models accurate, and what does it mean for program design. So we largely work on that. And on the enforcement side, there's also that same debate that's underlying why do firms or facilities not comply with environmental rules and regulations. Is it rational? They know the law, they know what they're supposed to do, they weigh costs and benefits, and they say, costs of doing uh, compliance outweigh the benefits, I'm not going to do it. Or is it that they don't understand the laws, they're complicated, they don't understand how they fit into their own systems, uh, and therefore there might be other approaches that would bring them into compliance. And then, of course, there's the bigger question, does better compliance lead to better environmental outcomes? So we focus on trying to understand what programs they're working with and what they'd like to try to improve. Again, like the DC labs, we don't try to come in with their own ideas, but we do try to shape some of their ideas based on what the available behavioral science looks like. Uh, but we try to find opportunities that would shed light on these larger issues so that there would be spillovers into other programs. So that's often the problem with these experiments, is that they're often very narrow. They answer a particular question for a particular program, and that's all it goes. And people can't easily extrapolate to other mission centers within the organization. So we try to find programs that do that. Now, I'm going to talk about why we do a lot of behavioral economics work, but 
One of the reasons is because it's easy in terms of cost, but it's also easy ethically in, in how they view these programs. I don't know if this is common in lots of other programs. I think in human services, there's becomes more of the health area where it's okay to treat people differently. But in the agriculture and environmental space, treating people differently is a huge hurdle to get over. Whether it's real or perceived, this idea that we can't you know, have a different version of a program for some and not for others, or communication and the way we interact with them, they're okay with those sorts of, uh, those sorts of testing. So we do a lot of that with these federal agencies. And then when we want to do bigger things, like change how programs are actually designed, change whether you're actually offering incentives and how much incentives. We tend to work with these partners because they tend to have more space, capacity, or willingness uh, to do those sorts of activities. So with Maryland Department of Environment, for example, we are randomizing warnings versus penalties because a lot of enforcement activities tend to rely on warnings rather than do enforcement actions with penalties because they're very expensive to do, but there's no real evidence on whether those warnings are effective, particularly if everybody knows that's what I'm going to get the first time I'm caught. Why bother complying if I know I'll get a warning and an extra chance to clean things up? Uh, with Nature Conservancy, we're randomizing whether farmers get incentives or they get these non-pecuniary sorts of approaches because these federal agencies, although We've talked with the lawyers, they have the ability to do this, it's just that it's hard. We'll talk about the incentive problem uh, after to do that. But I was told this is a lot about the behavioral insights and behavioral economics. So I want to talk about why we do a lot of this behavioral economics work in this evidence-based space. Is one, because there's this credible and growing evidence base that these interventions do actually work. There's lots of RCTs being run out there. The really interesting thing for us in the environmental and agricultural space is most of this evidence is for consumers or individuals making a decision on loan repayment or TANF, going to these meetings, or retirement savings. But in the environmental and agricultural space, we're typically talking about firms or businesses, operations, or farmers who are experts in their domains. They have competitive pressures on them. They tend to make high-stakes decisions. Uh, it's not clear whether these behavioral insights actually apply uh, to these, uh, these agents. They're often inexpensive, which people have talked about, which implies even if they get these small 2 percentage, 3 percentage point changes in participation or 5 percent change in behavior, they're still really cost effective. Uh, and we've found that to be true in all the experiments that we've been running. The important one for environmental in particular is often no new legislation or rules needed, often feasible politically. And what I mean by that is they have cover. No one's going to go and they're not going to get in trouble. We always say when we give examples, we show what we've done, how easy it was to do it, and we always say, and no one got hurt. Right? No one got in the media for doing this. There was no criticism. And you think particularly for the EPA. I mean, the EPA has historically been battered by both conservatives and liberals. So they're under the barricades, and now they're also getting from internally in the White House. So they're constantly surrounded. So this is a really big, important uh, attribute is can we get in trouble? Who's going to be upset with this? And a lot of these behavioral insights, people go, hmm, I can't think of anybody who would get too upset with that if an outreach is. So that allows us to do that kind of experimentation. And we're hoping, as was said, that some of this stuff will be a gateway drug because this stuff is easy to pilot inexpensive randomized controlled trials, makes it easier to evaluate effectiveness, build a solid evidence base, and we hope it will lead to other experiments. We haven't found that to be the case. That's why I was really interested to hear that there have been some of those cases. Uh, I know they exist, and we've had maybe one uh, of those in Maryland Department of Environment where we've done a series of experiments. But learning to figure out how do you make that scalable, where we're actually getting this culture of experimentation is something that we've been struggling with. We get these one-off sorts of uh, activities, and we're very much taking this champion approach, which I think a lot of people who are in this evidence-based approach do, is finding people within these units and agencies who are really engaged and interested problem is that those people often move out of those positions, their priorities need to change, or they find that their bosses change and their bosses no longer give them space to do that. We find that a lot. Like the EPA, we've run very few experiments. We've designed a lot. We've designed 
experiments that went a year and a half. We've got lawyers on, but we have rent, we have the website, the interface all set up. Regional director changes. The director says, "What? We're going to experiment? No, we're not going to do that. Cancels the whole thing." That's why I hope this evidence-based act creates some institutionalization, some incentives, some space for these things to go on because. The champion model, I'm not convinced that that's, that's an effective way to scale up evidence-based uh, policy making in the U.S. I didn't pay attention to what time I started, which is an amateur mistake. But did anybody pay attention? How much time do I have left? Ten minutes left? Continue. Okay. Continue. I got a couple minutes. Ten minutes. <laughs> so the two things we need are data and incentives, right, for doing this sort of work. And it's easier to rely on administrative data. These two centers rely on administrative data. Problem is, in USDA, those data are often difficult to access. I mean, we have USDA credentials in our staff. So we have the badges. We can get into the computer system. Still, we take years, literally years, to get the data to be able to evaluate some of the outcomes of our experiments. Uh, no panel data to do observational stuff, to look at persistence of impact. So a lot of the big questions that people want to answer, either the data don't exist or they exist but are not available because farmers do not like people looking into how much payments they're getting uh, and for what they're actually doing. And actually, you may have seen that USDA has gotten in trouble for not auditing, is actually checking to see whether or not they're delivering on what they get payment, uh, what they get paid for. EPA is a little bit different in the sense, I don't know if you know this, but all pollution data, more or less, in the United States is self-reported, like tax data. And even our audits don't actually have an easy chance of verifying pollution data. So even when we see outcomes changing, we're left with this like, problem of, are they changing how much they lie about what they pollute, or are they actually changing uh, their behaviors? But these are minor compared to the incentive <coughs> problem. This is a huge thing that has to be addressed. I was talking to Shelley about it before. Uh, how do you create incentives for people to want to do it? And it's the sense of rewards are really important, and also the space for failing and showing null results. Because most of the stuff, when you do large scale experiments, they tend to be small effects, they tend to be null effects. Uh, and people need to be rewarded for that. Right now, we reward for success. And that's what everybody delivers is success. Why would I want to do this testing where it's going to be more cumbersome and there's a very good chance it's going to fail and I won't be able to hide that easily. Treatment versus control is not that easy to finesse uh, those results. Uh, and for these two organizations in particular, there's a problem with incentives. The U.S. Department of Agriculture, the farmers are the customers. They're not, we're not trying to get stuff out of them, although there's been this change over decades where Used to be we gave farmers money to grow crops, now we give them money to produce these public goods, these environmental amenities. It's not really a customer sort of focus. These are suppliers now. But we still have that sort of mindset, so this idea of uh, testing things, other than customer satisfaction as a major performance metric, uh, is not really there. Uh, and the EPA has a particular one that all law enforcement <coughs> folks have this problem of. And it's exacerbated by these performance measurement and, and, and dashboards. Like, what are they being evaluated on? EPA's evaluate on is finding violations, finding million dollar plus violations. So if we do experiments to actually deter violations, so violations go down. So not only is it hard to get the experiments, but when they do, they're actually going to get punished for this. When EPA first realized that that's what we were designing these experiments to do, to, to reduce the number of violations, they said, how are we going to sell that? Which is a really strange thing to say, but all law enforcement do. How do you talk about deferred crimes, defer, uh, deterred murders? Right? You actually can re measure arrests, so we get lots of arrests. So creating the right incentives, both to do evaluations, and then when you're talking about performance metrics, making sure these metrics align with the evidence and the evaluation that we want is really important, and we're really far from that, at least in the domains that I'm working in. Thanks for your time. Okay, I'll just shout. Or do we have an extra mic, Ashley? Oh, yeah, right here. Hello?
So I'm going to suggest, in the interest of time, but Paul raised a, a global issue that I wanted everyone to talk about, this issue of incentives. And we'll talk about that in the Q&A after the break. But I wanted to uh, give you an opportunity, if there were points unrelated to that one, in Paul's excellent presentation, if you wanted to ask him about it or his general experience in this area. I don't want to see the same hands. Anybody? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, uh, uh, what you said about uh, having champions for this work really uh, rings true in it. I think it's like, like we have one over here. Um, <laughs> The, I'm wondering if you've thought about what the alternative structures are to that or how you might be able to do it absent like a huge sweeping agenda change from a decision maker that could be sustained across transitions. Right. It has to come from the top. It has to come from the people that hold the money. I mean, largely. I mean, philanthropic foundations, government agencies have to demand evidence and provide rewards for it. And that's part of the problem is we still don't provide rewards for it. People are promoted based on success, not on quality of evidence. Also, you, you get funds to do actions, not necessarily to produce evidence. You might get funds for evaluation, but you're still going to be rewarded if that evaluation shows it's a success. So it, I don't have the answer. If I did, you know, I'd be writing op-eds all over the place with my answer. But it has to come from the top. Right, so it's got to be a push down. And we've seen this in places like in Medicare with, you know, say we have to have this innovation center that's going to do testing. Uh, and the rewards for testing, in that case, it's often regulatory relief. Right? And if you do some testing, we're going to pull back some of this regulatory burden on you and give you a reward for that. There's got to be rewards like that where I ask you to do something and I'm going to give you some reward for it, whether it's reduce regulatory burden, extra money. Uh, for doing that sort of thing, extra fanfare, an award there. We don't have awards for best failure of the year. We should. Uh, and this is a problem in science more generally, is, is, you know, is rewarding failure. Uh, but uh, in, in particularly in the government space, in the program space, it's a problem. So, and the, the other thing I think is uh, necessary is a, a money that's separate from people's budget for this sort of thing. Because anytime a person has to spend money evaluating people who are not getting an intervention or collecting data for this, uh, you just don't, you're not going to get it. 